This morning we'll be starting a, a new series here in the adult class, the <coughs> back half of the adult class here. Uh, this morning, uh, as you see from your handout, the, the last week of Christ's life. Uh, it's just an outline of the next uh, few weeks that we'll be studying. Uh, nothing major, but just some scriptures. For those of you regular members, if you care to read ahead of time a little bit in the week ahead to see our, see our focus a little bit about the life of Christ. When we think about this, uh, we say, well, Jesus lived, what, 33 years or so? <clears throat> uh, what's so significant about his last week? We know very well that uh, all of the life of Christ came to a culmination in the last week. And the great major events of him driving the money changers out of the temple, his washing the disciples' feet, having the last supper, and then of course the betrayal and the arrest and the crucifixion was that last week. The last week started with the triumphal entry, by the way, uh, on Palm Sunday, as we call it. And in fact, the Gospel of John, virtually half of it, half the back half of the Gospel of John, just covers the last week of Christ's life. And we think about this, and so uh, that's, our, that's our goal, the next uh, uh, study that we have here for the next uh, month or two. When we think about Christ, we see in history <clears throat> at 33 years, and at the end, there's a cross. And we see that on top of steeples. We see that on necklaces and chains. And we see it in our churches. That it represents Jesus as Savior, hung between heaven and earth to be the payment for our sins. The cross is that pivotal point in our spiritual lives, the life of the world between light and dark. It's that pivotal event of all history that is the most important event that has ever occurred. The Apostle Paul writes in, in uh, one of his letters, Lesson Letter of Galatians uh, 6, verse 14. He says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus. Every time we begin a study, at least when we were in school, probably the teacher said, this is what we're going to do. This is why we're going to you know, learn algebra today. This is why we're going to learn English today, whatever it was. And I'll give you my little story about why I'd like to focus on the life of Christ this last week. You see, I grew up in an era in the Church of Christ <clears throat> that had a focus on things that sometimes we, we might have gotten a little derailed on. See, our, our focus, uh, when, we, when the Church of Christ was, was, uh, was, was formed and developed and the movement started in the early 1800s. One of our goals was to go back to the Bible. And that's good. That's, that's uh, reforming. That's uh, restoring. Yes, that's, 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 that's always our goal is to stay to, with the Bible. Because a lot of the religious uh, uh, trends had gotten away from that in the early 1800s. And so in our zeal to do that, uh, we focused very, very closely on the church, the New Testament church, the time of the first century and how they worshiped and, and all like that. And we got so obsessed with how the church did that sometimes we failed to see Jesus. And when I was growing up, uh, uh, we focused on the church. And as we know, the church, of course, 
is important. It's proper. It's, it's, it's the body of Christ alive today. The church is us. The church is able for us to be able to live and come and worship and sing and pray and commune and have leadership training for Christ for our kiddos. For us to have visitation when we have death and serious illness and, and have funeral meals and take care of each other. That's, that's the church. That's, that's our, our, our organism. We evangelize and we teach the gospel. But yet we got so hung up on how things were in the New Testament times that our eyes were blinded to Jesus. And I knew more about the church than I knew Jesus. And I don't want us to ever do that again. We focus on Jesus. And that's why we're here this morning. We were so proud of how pure we are. We were, a, a, our phrase was the New Testament church. We were a faithful church. We were a true church. We were a gospel believing church and all that. And we argued over minutia that we shouldn't have argued over. We split over things we shouldn't have split over. How many communion cups we had. Whether we had Sunday schools or not. Or whether we did this or that. And, and, and it's a horrible history that we don't ever want to repeat again because we lost sight of Jesus and for me this is a mission I have we go back to Christ we go back to Jesus now if we were to say all right God how are you going to save the world would we have come up with an idea about his son coming to this world, teaching, yes, but ultimately being rejected, and then being tortured and crucified in a gruesome way on a cross. We'd scratch our heads and say, Lord, wh why are you doing that? Why would you design it that way? Isn't there a better way? Why would you do this in a way that is so, so awful? It doesn't make sense to us, does it? And we're not the first ones to ask that question. Whenever we uh, think about uh, the life of Christ, whenever he was on earth, he began to teach that uh, one of these days I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified, but yet I'm going to raise, be raised on the third day. And sometimes he spoke uh, sort of uh, plainly about that, and sometimes he spoke in veiled language, uh, uh, obscure language about that. And we, we see this in uh, an example here in Matthew. Uh, this is the time that uh, Jesus was with his, with his 12, and Jesus says, uh, who do you think I am? And they said, well, uh, some people say that uh, maybe you're uh, John the Baptist, maybe come back to life, or maybe one of the old prophets, uh, Elijah or Jeremiah, or something like that. And Jesus says, well, yeah, I know that, but I want to know who do you think I am? And Peter, the leader of the twelve, who always spoke first, said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus says, Yes, sir, that is correct. And you just didn't figure that self, figure that out by yourself. God revealed that to you. You're a special man, Peter. You're going to be a leader in my church. Right after that, this is what Jesus said, did. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. That he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. This is, by the way, Matthew 16, chapter 
And Peter, though, took him aside and said, you shouldn't, it's just not going to happen. Peter began to rebuke Jesus. He said, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. As Jesus was trying to prepare his twelve for the crucifixion, he spoke plainly here. And Peter says, no, Jesus, it's not going to happen. We won't let it happen. I won't let it happen. And Jesus took Peter and said, No, get behind me, Satan. As if to say, Satan was using one of the twelve, Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, to attack him. For Jesus to say this, man, it was very serious. And Jesus said, no, Peter, just get away from me. You're doing the work of Satan here by trying to make me doubt and I'm trying to short-circuit God's plan. You do not have the concerns of God, but you have the concerns of man. So here was Peter, even the great Peter, saying, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand. Jesus, you're Messiah, you're Christ, you're the Son of God. You admitted that that was <clears throat> who you are just now. And, and now you're saying you're going to let yourself be killed. This doesn't make sense, Peter said. And yet Jesus has to say, yes, you don't understand. Don't do the work of Satan. Come with me and follow me. And so they struggled with that just like we do when we view the cross. How could Jesus have gone through with that? When we see about this cross, the Apostle Paul talks very plainly. This is your 1 Corinthians chapter 1 passage that to those who do not believe, <clears throat> the cross does not make sense. And Paul makes some pretty hard statements here. He uses some words that we're really reluctant to say. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. And he's talking now to the <clears throat> people in Corinth, Greece, and the, the Greek people at that time, that part of the world, were quite advanced in their sophistication and education. They were quite uh, big on discussing and talking about issues of life, uh, sitting around uh, uh, discussing all the great philosophical ways of life. And Paul knows this. He says in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul says it's foolishness, it's folly, it's nonsense to those who do not believe. These are harsh words. These are words we don't want to say about the cross. But yet Paul did. <clears throat> and he says, if you don't believe, if, you're, if, you, if, if, if your mind is blinded to faith and you're not drawn to the cross, it doesn't make sense. Foolishness. But yet if you are saved, if you are drawn to the cross. The cross is the power of God. He goes on to 
was saying, verse 22, and talking about the Jews and now these Greek people, he says, the Jews demand signs and the Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But for those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, this, this cross is now the power of God and the wisdom of God. Anybody who was crucified was a loser, defeated, rejected, shamed. The lowest of the law. He says now, this is the power of God for those who believe. Uh, Jesus uh, is the power of God through the cross, Paul says. He said, uh, you know, the Jews demand signs. That is, you know, Jesus, do us a trick. That was a, some of the things that they asked him to do when he was on earth. Jesus, do a miracle for us. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do it. The only miracle I'm going to do for you is the sign of Jonah, which means as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so I will be in the belly of the earth and be ready to resurrect it back to life. That's the only sign I'm going to do for you, Jesus said to those people who wanted him to prove himself. And he says the Greeks look for wisdom. They want to figure this out. And we can sit all day long and try to figure out the wisdom of the cross intellectually. Does it make sense? Because you see, the Messiah was going to be the great leader. The Messiah was going to be the warrior that was going to come and overthrow uh, the Roman armies that were keep occupying Israel at the time. And the Messiah was going to be their great leader. And the Messiah is not crucified. The Messiah doesn't die. Jesus says, I'm going to die. This was a stumbling block, as Paul calls it. Something we trip over. I can't accept it, as we would say in our words. I just can't swallow that. A God of heaven coming to earth and dying. Even the Greeks, the Gentile people who worshipped all the gods of the heavens. He wouldn't let someone from the heavens come down and then be captured and tortured and killed, would you? That just doesn't make sense. And so Paul says, you're right. It doesn't make sense if you're looking at it through earthly eyes. But we look at it through faith. We look at it through the wisdom of God. Now let me pause here. If you got a comment or question, flag me down, and we can talk about this even more. But uh, in the Old Testament, uh, for one to be crucified was 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 said to be uh, uh, cursed. Uh, you were it was said in, in the Old Testament law that if you were crucified, uh, just, just be sure to take the body down before sundown because it's, it's very disgraceful to uh, leave a body on the cross so long uh, over, overnight. So be sure to do that. And so Jesus was considered cursed because he was uh, crucified. And the claims that he made that uh, he would be raised on the third day they didn't remember. They didn't remember that very well. And they struggled with that. This great stumbling block of not being able to, to accept the foolishness of the cross is what Paul talks about here uh, in 1 Corinthians. And he says, uh, uh, 
yet this, this cross is uh, the power of God and the wisdom of God. When we think about this whole scheme, this whole plan, if you look at it through the eyes of, of us as just mere humans, yes, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all because why would God do it this way? And the answer, as we know, is that God showed his love to us in ways that we'll never, ever understand. There's another passage that we'll uh, talk about from John chapter 12. And John uh, here records another action of uh, Jesus' life where Jesus is trying to tell his uh, apostles, his 12, about what's going to happen uh, as he goes to Jerusalem and, and, uh, and all the uh, aspects of uh, what will happen. And here's a time when Jesus speaks sort of obscurely about his coming crucifixion. He says, uh, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, he says, I will draw all people to myself. And then the gospel uh, writer John, this is John chapter 12, verse 32, says, Jesus said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. Jesus used the phrase, when I'm lifted up, and, and that was their code word for being crucified. That was his euphemism for being crucified. This is what Jesus said uh, to his 12. When I'm lifted up, then I will draw all men to me, all people to me. Somehow, I will attract people through this crucifixion. And when we think about this, we think about Jesus, we think about him attracting people. Now on this earth, did he, uh, did he attract people? Did he uh, want to impress people with who he was when he was on this earth? When he was preaching, did he go around from town to town, uh, much like a politician, to give a good speech and rally the crowd and uh, uh, get people behind him, get support? No. I can only think of one rally, one political rally that Jesus was at, where Jesus was a sinner. And yes, the, the crowds chanted, but they chanted, crucify him, crucify him. Well, did people follow Jesus, uh, as we say, for uh, power and glory? If, if, he, if he really is the Son of God, um, he's got to be important. He's got to be uh, strong and all that. So let me, let me, let me follow Jesus and, and uh, maybe some of that will rub off on me. But Jesus says, if my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. So that's not going to happen. Well, did people follow Jesus because of his riches, his rich, richness and his luxurious life and all the cushy things Jesus had and uh, had around him? And Jesus said, you know, if you want to follow me, you've got to count the cost. You have to take up your cross and follow me. Uh, the foxes have holes to live in. The birds of the nest have uh, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, don't follow me if you're looking for ease and riches and luxury. And then when you think about the cross itself, what's attractive about crucifixion. Nothing. It's gruesome. It's awful. It's hard enough to imagine in our own eyes. It's hard enough to look at a picture of a crucifixion. But can you imagine being present physically at a 
crucifixion. It's something we couldn't watch. It's something that is re repulsive. It's something that we shun, turn away from. And so that doesn't draw us. So when Jesus says, when I lift it up, I will draw all people to me. That attraction, then, is not based on uh, logic. It's not based on our earthly uh, reasoning, our earthly uh, uh, desires to follow a leader and, and have, a, have a great uh, political leader lead us. But we're drawn by this one immutable fact, and that is that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves us. And this cross, this folly, this nonsense, this stumbling block, this cross <coughs> is the representation of the love of God given to us in a way that we never understand. And so the purest of the purest reasons that we follow Jesus because he loves us. And God did his best to weed out all other reasons for us to follow him except the one pure one and that is to see the beauty and the power of the cross of Christ. Alright, let me stop there. Let me, let me ask for any, any questions or, or thoughts on how the cross um, attracts us. How the cross draws us uh, to him. Yes, sir, Dr. May. Just to follow up, isn't it interesting how God works where he takes something as lowly and despised as a cross yes. and turns it into the banner of his church? Correct. Yes. Something we would never design. Something we would never think about. If it was right in our purview to do that. We'd never do that. The rejection, the curse of the cross from the Old Testament has now become the glory. That's now on top of every steeple. And if you've ever traveled to the East Coast, the old, old cities on the East Coast, uh, you know, New York, Philadelphia, and all right there, you know, the first uh, settlers built the tallest church steeples they could. And you can see those old cities that aren't maybe very uh, shiny these, these days. The tallest you can see is a cross on top of a steeple. It's not just cement. It's not just wood. It's not just metal. But it's the power of God. And it means so much image is an image. It's a symbol. You know, a sign, sign just says something like, you know, <coughs> post office this way. But a symbol incorporates that sign into a meaning. And the cross is the giving of Jesus in our stead. Yes. Was there another thought over here somewhere? Maybe anybody? All right. Um, when we think about uh, uh, Jesus and uh, signs, let's see, that was Matthew 16, I believe. You know, Jesus, yes, was the Messiah. And they knew when the Messiah came that... Uh, he would be special, and he would be uh, powerful, and that he would be uh, the Son of God. Their view of him, of course, was that he would be an earthly king, he would be an earthly leader, he would be a military leader, and he was uh, uh, going to be a physical so when Jesus came, did he do miracles? Yes, he did. To support himself, 
meaning to support his claim that he was God's son. And yet, uh, when the Jews pinned him down in you know, word conflict here, to say, Jesus, uh, you claim to be the son of God, uh, why don't you show us a sign? Uh, this is uh, Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4. I'll just read this briefly. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. And he replied, Well, when evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for signs, but none will be given them except the sign of Jonah. And Jesus left and then went away. Now, our mentality would say, Jesus, here's your chance. Here's your opening. They said, do us a miracle and we'll believe. And we would think, Jesus, makes sense to do that. So come on, do a miracle and help yourself. Would these people have believed if he'd have done a miracle? No, probably not. And they weren't looking for faith. They were looking for a sideshow. They were looking at something to razzle-dazzle. Jesus knew that. And Jesus says, uh, no, I'm not going to give you a sign. But let's think about this a little bit. You know, you, uh, you're observant, and you can see uh, the weather. This is uh, what we do. You know, now we have, I think, you know, the weather on our, on our iPhones, but uh, they look at the weather. It's gray in the morning, that's normal. It's red in the morning, not rain. It's red in the evening, probably dry weather. Gray in the evening, maybe rain. He says, you know how to do that. But you cannot perceive the signs of the times. And he says, you're a wicked and adulterous generation. You do this looking for a sign and for the wrong reasons. But no sign will be given you except the sign of Jonah. And again, this was the man that got swallowed by the big fish for three days and then put back on land to do God's will. The sign of Jonah, Jesus says, this three days in the earth and then back out will be the only sign I will give you. Now, we have to ask ourselves, as Peter had to ask himself. Do we have the concerns of God or do we have the concerns of just, just human wisdom in our, in our lives? When we look at uh, our lives, we all have jobs, we all have families, we all have concerns, we all have aches and pains and ups and downs. And we say, uh, Jesus, Show me a sign and give me what I want. And God says, no, I'll give you what you need. You ask me, yes. Ask me what you think you want. But I'll give you what you need. See, the Jews here asked for a sign. Jesus didn't give them a sign what they wanted. He gave them what they needed, which was a statement that said, there's something deeper here that you're going to have to find. So when God asks us to follow him and we look at the cross and we see the, the nonsense of the cross, the foolishness of the cross, everything else needs to fade away in importance except that. And be it our Teachings, let's see, as a youngster, I knew more about the church 
than Jesus. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be opposite. Because the church flows from Jesus. And when we have families, and when we have kiddos, oh, yes, they're important. They're good. They're perfect. They're, they're created in the image of God. Yes. God's gifts. But it's all wound up in the cross. This is God's workings. These are God's gifts to us. And you see, the worldly person, the worldly man, looks at children and say, okay, you bet they're bright and they're smart and I'm going to send them to the best schools and they're going to do baseball and <laughs> soccer and they're going to you know, excel in sports and excel in school and they're going to go to the best colleges and they're going to get rich and all that stuff. But yet Jesus says, follow me. Not for success and riches, but follow me. Because the cross draws us. Because he loves us. So let's remember that as we see Jesus offering a sign. Our sign is the cross. Our sign is that.